Okay, you are here. You are actually in a limbo between sections. So I want to make a few general comments about how spy flash access works on Intel systems because this content is particular to Intel. It's not specific to spy. So the reason that a attacker would be interested in infecting the BIOS is because as we said at the very beginning, they who run first run best. And the BIOS is code that lives on a flash chip soldered onto the motherboard. It is not vulnerable to detection by defenders due to things like hard drive forensics or typical security tools. Because the code is running at such high privilege, they can generally manipulate any sort of security tools that would attempt to catch them. If a defender does actually manage to find it, then they'll actually have a very difficult time removing it because the attacker can prevent things like normal firmware updates from overriding themselves. So SPY is the serial peripheral interface, and as the name suggests, it's a serial hardware protocol for interfacing with peripherals. In our context, we're mostly interested in it interfacing with a non-volatile storage chip like a SPY flash chip. It can actually be used for just arbitrary communication between peripherals, but we care about accessing the flash. On modern systems, the SPY flash chip is not only used to store the firmware for the BIOS proper, which runs from the reset vector of the CPU, it's also used to store information for peripheral processors like the Intel Management Engine, the Intel Integrated Gigabit Ethernet, or embedded controllers on newer systems. Because the SPY protocol uses 24-bit addressing, that means that you only have 2 to the 24 bits to specify what the offset is inside of the SPY flash chip, and consequently that means you have a 16 megabyte limit for a typical SPY flash chip. But Intel does support up to two different SPY flash chips, allowing vendors to have up to 32 megabytes of storage. While the SPY protocol can run up to, for instance, 100 megahertz, Intel systems and the hardware that interacts with their SPY flash chips typically runs between 20 and 66 megahertz. So you can see that's actually quite slow and that's why reading information and writing information to a SPY flash chip is quite slow. At the very beginning, very, very beginning of the class in the setting up your lab section, you were supposed to use chipsec in order to dump out the full contents of the flash chip. And that probably took a while because access to flash chips is slow because they're running at such slow speeds. But regardless of those sort of hardware details, the fact of the matter is Intel is going to abstract away all of the hardware details and just provide us with very nice memory mapped IO registers to peek and poke at, and consequently we'll be able to interact with the spy flash storage without needing to know any of these low level details. Now the interesting thing about SPY is that it's actually not a fully specified protocol. There's basically just de facto things, and SPY flash chips in particular don't have to conform to any particular requirements. So consequently, Intel has specified in their data sheets that if you want to use a SPY flash chip with an Intel system, it needs to support the following commands as a minimum. From there, their particular hardware is going to actually know how to send those commands to the SPY flash chip behind the scenes so that we don't have to care about it when we want to read and write. Now, Intel hardware in particular can interact with spy flash chips in a couple of ways. So originally, they always behaved in a particular way, which we're going to call non-descriptor mode. Eventually, in the ICH-8, they added a thing called descriptor mode. And this was basically a introduction of a data structure at the beginning of the spy flash chip called the flash descriptor. And the hardware would go out and read this data structure in order to understand things about, you know, what the spy flash part was, information about where different regions were so that it could lock things down for hardware access controls and things like that. So basically, descriptor mode is what you're going to see on all modern systems, starting with ICH 8 and 10, 8 through 10, and those supported multiple modes, but on all modern PCH-based systems, we're only going to be seeing descriptor mode. Non-descriptor mode is not supported anymore. But I'm covering it very briefly here just because of the fact that Intel Atom chips actually support both modes. And so if you go off and want to look at some embedded systems using Atom chips, you should be aware that non-descriptor mode is a thing, even though we almost exclusively focus on descriptor mode in this class. So what does descriptor mode look like for practical purposes? Well, you've got a spy flash chip, and that chip is going to be mapped into memory at the high four gigabyte range. We already saw that at the very beginning of the class. FFFF0, the reset vector, corresponds to code at the end of the spy flash chip. But in non-descriptor mode, if you had a spy flash chip that was less than 16 megabytes, you would actually see the same flash chip contents mapped multiple times up to the end of memory minus 16 limit. So if it was four megabytes, you would see the same thing mapped four times. 
And the sort of key property of non-descriptor mode is that it's just a straight mapping of spy flash contents to memory map contents. In contrast to this, descriptor mode, as I said, introduces a flash descriptor data structure that talks about how the different portions of the flash can be used because the flash chip is actually reused for multiple things. Like we said, integrated Intel uh, gigabit ethernet management engine and embedded controller on newer things. Those will coexist with the BIOS on the spy flash chip and they can potentially be reading and writing the spy flash chip independently. The data structure at the beginning of the flash chip breaks it up into different regions which can be used for things like the integrated Intel gigabit ethernet, the management engine, or embedded controllers. It also provides hardware support for restricting access between these so that, for instance, the management engine can't write to the BIOS and the BIOS can't write to the management engine. You can learn a lot more about that later on in some optional material. Descriptor mode also introduces an interesting capability for what's called soft straps. So a hard strap is usually a place in the hardware where a particular pin is pulled up to a high voltage or down to a low voltage, and that will actually change the behavior of the hardware. Soft straps are configurable things that again change the behavior of the hardware, but instead of the hardware manufacturer having to hard code those things to a high voltage or low voltage to get the behavior they want, they can actually place data into the SPI flash chip in the soft strap region, and that will change the behavior of the hardware. It allows for easier prototyping and configuration and trying things out when they're first developing the system. Now in contrast with the non-descriptor mode, in descriptor mode, because there are different regions and because the BIOS is assigned one of those regions, it is only the BIOS region which ultimately gets mapped into memory at the high address range. The rest of it is not directly visible or accessible. Even if this thing was a small flash chip, you would still not be able to see these other regions like the management engine region mapped into memory. You would still be able to access it if you went directly to flash chip, it just isn't mapped to memory by default. Now that said, if someone were to actually corrupt the data structure at the beginning of the spy flash chip, the system, if it supports both non-descriptor and descriptor mode, would revert to behaving as a non-descriptor system, and it would return to, you know, multi-mapping things. And in particular, if there were other regions like the management engine, they would become visible in the memory at that point. Now you're not supposed to be able to corrupt that data structure at the very beginning because Intel specifies the data structure itself should say something about protecting itself so that normal hardware can't get in there, but a physical attacker should be able to read the entire flash chip as well. But here's just an example that was taken from an older system that supported descriptor and non-descriptor mode where the descriptor was corrupted, and then you can actually see that at multiple different addresses we see the same contents. And this particular contents is the sort of offset zero contents which has a corrupted descriptor. Because the magic number is supposed to be 0F, F0, A5, 5A, but it was corrupted to end with 5B instead. The last thing that I wanna talk about is the concept of direct access versus register access to the spy flash chip. We've already seen how the contents of the spy flash chip for the reset vector are mapped into physical memory at the high range at four gigabytes minus whatever the size of the BIOS region is on descriptor mode systems. And when we're talking about direct access, it turns out that the fact that the flash chip could be shared between different peripheral processors like the management engine and the main CPU, direct access automatically in descriptor mode is restricted so that the BIOS can only get access to the BIOS region and the management engine can only get access to the management engine region. When it comes to register access, which is via the memory mapped IO registers that we're gonna be finding in the next section, there's actually part of the data structure of the flash descriptor specifies different access controls for register access. So for instance, the BIOS may be able to write to the management engine, for instance, to update the management engine firmware, but it could set access control so that the management engine can't write back to the BIOS. 